So the Jews are leaving Egypt, and God takes care of payment for all those years of slave labor. He tells Moses, Moshe, to command the Jews to request gold and silver from their Egyptian neighbors. The Egyptians are only too glad to comply. They give the Jews a ton of gold and silver and send them out of Egypt. But one Jew has a different task. Moshe is out there looking for the bones of Yosef, Joseph, who had been mummified years before after his death by the Egyptians. Moshe wants those bones because he wants to put them in a casket and take them out of Egypt to eventually be buried in the Promised Land. But wouldn't it have been more fitting to have someone from Yosef's tribe, one of his descendants, in charge of taking his bones out? Moshe, after all, is from the tribe of Levi, not from the tribe of Yosef. I want to propose an answer, but in order to understand it, we have to go back to a key scene in Yosef's life. He's sitting in the Egyptian dungeon after having been falsely accused of violating his master's wife. Pharaoh at this time is in his palace, and he's tortured. He's had these dreams, and they are driving him crazy. He's so desperate that on the advice of his wine minister, he calls Yosef, the Jewish, convicted felon, out of the dungeon to interpret his dreams. Why was he so desperate? And even more stunningly, why wasn't there anyone on his staff that could interpret the dreams? This was ancient Egypt. Pharaoh had wizards on his staff and warlocks and sorcerers and neuromancers, tarot card readers, astrologers. No one could interpret the dream. So the famous commentator Rashi, with his typical ear for nuance, points out that the Torah actually says that no one was able to interpret the dreams for Pharaoh. They were able to interpret the dreams all right, but Pharaoh didn't like the interpretation upon which they had agreed. They were telling him, unfortunately, sire, the dreams mean that you're going to have seven daughters and they're all going to die and you're going to have to bury them. That's why he's so desperate. So he calls the Jewish felon out of the dungeon, and Yosef listens to the dreams and reinterprets them. He tells Pharaoh, here's what they mean. There are going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And then in the same breath, he starts giving advice. Here's what you should do, Pharaoh. You should find someone who's very wise and understanding and appoint him to be in charge, to prepare during the years of plenty for the years of famine. Now you have to wonder, why didn't Pharaoh chop Yosef's head off right there and then? Young Mr. Jewish fellow, who I just brought up out of the dungeon, I asked you to interpret my dreams. I didn't ask for any advice. Maybe what's going on here is that Yosef is sending a message to Pharaoh. Your Excellency, I know how to interpret dreams, and I know why you must have been so desperate. Were your staff members telling you something about daughters dying? If you like my interpretation better, and you want mine to come true instead of theirs, then you had better not put me back into that dungeon. You'd better put me in charge. And Pharaoh listens. So if we were summarizing this scene, we might say that our leader, Yosef, by reinterpreting the dreams, saved Pharaoh's daughters so that they could live and be brought up in Pharaoh's palace. Fast forward the clock. Are we surprised that years later when our leader's life is forfeit, when young baby Moses is in the Nile River in that little basket and he's going to die unless he's saved, who does God send to save him? Pharaoh's daughter. And where does she bring him up? In the palace. Because God acts and repays our deeds, mida keneged mida, precisely measure for measure. Our leader saves Pharaoh's daughters. They're brought up in the palace. So Pharaoh's daughter saves our leader, and he's brought up in the palace. So who better than Moshe to go find the mummy, to go find Yosef's bones and take them out of Egypt to repay 
that long-standing debt of gratitude.